Hello, brothers and sisters. Babylon occupies a position of prominence in the book of Revelation. She is conspicuous in many of the principal prophecies of the Bible. She occupies an eminent place in history and in the scriptures. She is pictured as an enemy of God, making slaves of God's people. Babylon and her doom has already been mentioned by the prophet in Revelation 14 verse 8, where her fall was anticipated and announced because she had caused earth's inhabitants to partake of her false doctrines. Babylon is represented also as coming in remembrance before God during the seventh plague. Revelation chapter 16 verse 19. Obviously Babylon is the main object of God's wrath. Actually God's people are invited to leave Babylon for two reasons. One, so that they will not be guilty of the sins of Babylon. And two, that they will not be the recipients of the wrath of God poured out on Babylon. Revelation chapter 18 verse 4. Great Babylon in a broad sense pictures the system of apostate religion throughout all human history. The beast on which the woman rides represents Satan's particular kind of government. The seven heads symbolize the devil's seven universal attempts to control world affairs. The devil favors a unity of church and state. In his attempt to hinder God's work, he has always used some form of religion to control civil power. However, it will be seen that there is only one exception to this rule. That is, during the time referred to in Revelation 17 verse 8, when the beast is not. Revelation chapters 17 and 18 focus specifically on Babylon, which is first mentioned in the second angel's message of Revelation chapter 14. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Revelation chapter 14, verse 8. In Revelation chapter 17 and 18, two symbols are used to represent Babylon. An immoral woman, chapter 17, and a dominating city, chapter 18. These symbols combine in the following verse, demonstrating that they represent the same power. And the woman whom you saw is that great city, which reigns over the kings of the earth. Revelation chapter 17, verse 18. The woman, a harlot, depicts Babylon's corruption and her ripeness for destruction. The city depicts Babylon's oppressive power. Both symbols portray a powerful religious organization. The book of Revelation features two women and two cities. This imagery is drawn from the Old Testament, where two women are used to represent the two literal cities of Babylon and Jerusalem. Come down and sit in the dust. O virgin daughter of Babylon, Isaiah chapter 47 verse 1. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely and delicate woman, Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 2. In Revelation, the two women represent in turn spiritual Babylon, the counterfeit church, the synagogue of Satan, and then spiritual Jerusalem, the church of God, two opposing religious organizations. The term Babylon had its origin shortly after the great deluge which destroyed the earth and its inhabitants. God made a covenant with man and promised never again to destroy the earth by water. Genesis chapter 9 verses 11 through 17. But those who do not believe God set up their own plan of salvation in rebellion against God. The 10th and 11th chapters of Genesis reveal what followed. Turning to these chapters of national origins, we learned that the beginning of the kingdom of Nimrod, the grandson of Ham, was Babel, or Babylon, in the land of Shinar, where the then inhabitants of the earth, who were as yet of one language and one speech, had journeyed eastward to settle. The implication is that they came thither under the leadership of Nimrod, and that under him began that first great work of rebellion against God, which brought the confusion of tongues, and inaugurated the original of all the subsequent harlotries and abominations of mankind. Against the command and known intent of the Almighty, it was their undertaking to build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and to make themselves a name that they might not be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. This chapter contains explanations of a number of symbols which will prove helpful. Babylon is especially singled out for judgment. Therefore, it will be necessary to observe her character, her actions, and her end. The chapter divides naturally into two parts dealing with the women and the beast. Here is presented Satan's great masterpiece of deception, which from its beginning has been in opposition to God and his people. This false, confusing system of worship has deliberately rebelled against God and has been an integral part of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. We can expect a fuller development of the principles of Babylon in the immediate future just prior to the return of Christ. In the last great crisis, the powers of evil will form an unholy alliance with the political leaders of earth, giving themselves up to the short-lived joys of Babylon's cup of wine. Therefore, the message of God sent through Jeremiah to his people who were in ancient Babylon before her destruction is pertinent now. Babylon have been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine. Therefore the nations are mad, flee out of midst of Babylon, and deliver every man his soul, 
Be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. Jeremiah chapter 51 verse 7. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and they saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the women drunken with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Verses 1 through 6. Chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. The Judgment of the Harlot of Babylon. Chapter 17, 18, and part of 19 deal with the judgment of Babylon the Great. In Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 through 6, the crimes for which God executes judgment upon the harlot, the Roman papal system, are enumerated. In chapter 17, verses 7 through 18, her punishment and the means by which it will come to pass is pronounced. In chapter 17, John is shown something by one of the angels of the plagues. The scene is in the wilderness. This brings our minds to the 1260 years the Roman church ruled the world, and the persecuted people of God were forced into obscurity. Now we see this persecuting power drunken with the blood of the martyrs. She has already committed fornication with the kings of the earth, and the people of earth have been deceived and made drunk by the wine of her false teachings. So this indicates the time very accurately at the end of the 1260 year period of papal rule in the dark ages. The timing is important to rightly interpret the message this chapter has for us today. What does he see? A woman, which symbolizes a church, and she is riding on a savage beast, which represents the world, governments, and powers used by Satan to persecute God's people. She is called a whore, a woman that goes out with other men, not her husband, for money. The true church is a pure woman, and she is the bride of Christ. But this woman, though she claims to belong to Jesus, has relations with all the kings and governments, and she does it for money and power. That is why she is called the great whore. According to Ephesians 5, Jesus is the spiritual husband of the church. Therefore, if a church unites with or receives favor of one who is not her husband, she commits spiritual adultery. The kings of the earth represent civil powers. When churches lose the power of the gospel to transform hearts and lives, they turn to the power of the state to support their doctrines, and thus they commit spiritual fornication. The many waters or the countless people, verse 15, she has deceived and made drunk with her doctrines. Historically, the great majority of biblical scholars have affirmed that the women of Revelation chapter 17 represents the Church of Rome. This is because there are a number of specifications by which the women may be identified, and every one of these fits that organization perfectly. Note, in identifying the Church of Rome or any other religious entity, this exposition is not referring to individuals, but to a system. It is evident that whatever is pictured here has to do especially with the last days or the time of the end. John was plainly instructed by one of the seven plague angels, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Revelation chapter 17 verse 1. In the preceding chapter, the last three plagues appear to have been especially designed as a judgment upon Babylon. During the seventh plague, Babylon is mentioned as being remembered by God upon whom is poured the cup of the wine of the fishness of his wrath. Revelation chapter 16 verse 19. This woman is the reason for the seven last plagues. Her character and her deeds deserve the unmingled wrath of God without mercy. The prophet was shown a royal union of church and state. The woman was sitting upon a scarlet colored beast. As a symbol, a beast represents kings or kingdoms. Daniel chapter 7 verse 17, 23. So this woman or the church is seated upon civil power. She is upheld by the state. It is a picture of the church controlling and guiding civil government to further her own desires. She is called the mother of harlots, which is interpreted to mean the mother of fornications. Revelation chapter 17 verse 5 margin. There is a close relationship between this woman and the nations of earth in that she sitteth upon many waters. Furthermore, the kings of the earth are said to have committed fornication with her and the wine of her fornication, which is false doctrine, has caused the peoples of earth to become drunken. Chapter 17 verses 3 through 6. The main difference between the beast of Revelation 13 and the combined power represented by the beast and the woman here is that a distinction is made between the religious and political aspects of papal power. 
The scarlet colored beast represents the governments. The women, the apostate church, rides upon the beast, symbolizing the church controlling the state. In contrast to the pure church of Revelation 12, this woman is arrayed in purple and scarlet with gold and jewelry. She is a part of Babylon, the great city that Satan has set up in opposition to the new Jerusalem of God. The Roman Catholic Church has proudly styled herself as the mother church, but here she is called the mother of harlots. From the mother have come various Protestant denominations which profess to be clean and pure, vehemently rejecting the corruptions of the Catholic Church. But these churches have shown a distressing tendency to follow their mother's example of sacrificing truth and the approval of God and to seek the power of the state to enforce doctrine. And thus they choose to become harlots with their mother. This woman is the devil's counterfeit of the true church. It is one great vast system of evil. She proclaims error by corrupting truth which results in confusion. Paul represents God's church as being a chaste virgin. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 2 This harlot woman is therefore symbolic of an apostate religion. What a clear description of the Roman church. See her colors. Purple and scarlet. Look at her riches and jewels. And she has a golden cup in her hand full of false doctrines, which make people spiritually drunk when they believe them. She is a mother church. This is exactly what the Roman power claims to be. The Protestant churches are her daughters. And she is indeed drunken with the blood of saints and martyrs for Jesus. As she has persecuted and killed them by the millions. Jesus never wants his church to use the power of earthly governments and courts to make others obey her wishes. As John sees this scene, he is amazed at the sight. The attire of this woman says a lot concerning her character and actions. She is attractive and seductive. She has gathered together and surrounded herself with those things the world regards as the most valued possessions of material wealth. Her external glory is designed to appeal to the natural heart and imagination of man. She wins the heart of the so-called Christian world by taking God from their thoughts. But even worse, she holds a golden cup in her hand. This contains the wine of her fornication. Drinking from this cup makes the nations mad, drunk, confused. Her meretricious charms are said to have made all nations drink of this cup. Revelation chapter 14 verse 8. They yielded to her seductions. The golden cup contains the depths of sin to which this harlot woman has sunk. She is appropriately characterized by idolatry and corruption. This emblem of the harlot woman with the cup in her hand was derived from ancient Babylon and Greece. In the early 19th century, Rome chose this same symbol to represent herself. In 1825, on the occasion of the Jubilee, Pope Leo XII struck a medal bearing on the one side his own image and on the other that of the Church of Rome symbolized as the woman, holding in her left hand a cross and in her right a cup, with the legend around her, Sedat Super Universum. The whole world is her seat, the two Babylons, page 6. Look at the name she wears. It is made public and indelibly stamped on her forehead so that there need be no misunderstanding concerning her true character. Her name is a compound one. First, she is termed mystery. This indicates what has been kept secret or hidden, and only those who have the mind of Christ, Philippians chapter 2 verse 5, can understand. She should have stood for God and his truth, but instead she stands for error and wickedness. Second, she is named Babylon the Great. This great system is in its worst condition just before the return of Christ. She is the culmination of all evil. Third, the last terminology is the most descriptive. The mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. Her offspring is no better than she is. She is the mother of all systems and doctrines used by Satan to turn men from God. She is the parent of all that is morally loathsome. She is truly drunk with the blood of the saints. History records the deeds of the papacy as it used the state to persecute and kill millions of faithful Christians during the Dark Ages. The Catholic Church has disguised herself with humble apologies for these actions, but she has not changed. The same spirit of persecution will again be exhibited against God's faithful children who will not drink the wine of her corruption just before the second coming of Christ. The sight of this woman drunk with the blood of the martyrs caused great concern so that John said, I wondered with great admiration. In a general sense, Babylon has been responsible for the blood of the martyrs of all ages. Revelation chapter 18 verse 24. However, this woman's significance has to do especially with the prospective martyrs in the closing scenes of earth's history. Babylon will be held accountable for the death decreed upon the righteous even though she will be prohibited from slaying them. By condemning the people of God to death, they have as truly incurred the guilt of their blood as if it had been shed by their hands. The Triumph of God's Love, page 369. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore did thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman, and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world 
when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains, on which the women sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was, and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seventh, and go into two perdition. Verses 7 through 11. After giving to John this vision concerning the judgment of Babylon, the angel assumes the responsibility of interpretation. The history of the scarlet colored beast is related in symbolic language. The angel promises to reveal four things. The mystery of the woman, the beast, the seven heads, and the ten horns. It must be remembered that what John is shown here has to do with the time of the end, just prior to Christ's second event. Under the guise of toleration, Satan is working to deceive, through his trinity of error, the dragon, paganism, the beast, Catholicism, and the false prophet, apostate Protestantism. Read Revelation chapter 16 verses 13 through 16. In the last days, the papacy is still alive and prospering. However, there is one difference between Catholicism of the Dark Ages and that of our day. In 1798, the church lost her power to persecute, and the deadly wound inflicted against the beast has not yet been healed. What were the circumstances which brought about this loss of power? During the papal supremacy, 538 to 1798, the church and state were united. Whenever this is the case, the church dictates, and the state enforces the will of the church. By 1797, the French government was developing plans to end the papal power. One of the first measures of the new government, the Directory, was to dispatch an order to Joseph Bonaparte at Rome to promote, by all the means of his power, the approaching revolution in the Papal States, and above all things, to take care that, at the Pope's death, he was ill, 1797, no successor should be elected to the chair of St. Peter. Archibald Allison, History of Europe, Volume 1, Chapter 26, New York, Harper, 1852, pages 543, 544. The object of the French Directory was the destruction of the Pontifical government as the irreconcilable enemy of the Republic. The aged Pope, Pius VI, was summoned to surrender the temporal government. On his refusal, he was dragged from the altar. His rings were torn from his fingers. And finally, after declaring the temporal power abolished, the victors carried the Pope prisoner into Tuscany, whence he never returned, 1798. The Papal States, converted into the Roman Republic, were declared to be in perpetual alliance with Rome. But the French general was the real master at Rome. The territorial possessions of the clergy and monks were declared national property and their former owners cast into prison. The papacy was extinct. Not a vestige of its existence remained. And among all the Roman Catholic powers, not a finger was stirred in its defense. The eternal city had no longer prince or pontiff. Its bishop was a dying captive in foreign lands. And the decree was already announced that no successor would be allowed in his place. George Trevor, Rome from the fall of the Western Roman Empire, London, the Religious Tract Society, 1868, pages 439, 440, quoted in SDA Bible Commentary Source Book, Volume 9, page 701. By the year 1800, Napoleon weakened and permitted another pope to be elected. However, he no longer controlled the state. The power to persecute was gone. About this same time, ideas of religious freedom and the separation of church and state were gaining ground. In 1776, these ideas were incorporated into the American Constitution, and in France, the leaders of the French Revolution proclaimed civil and religious freedom. In this setting, their doctrines of anti-God and anti-Bible were able to get a noticeable foothold. Political and religious freedom has been spreading in all parts of the world. Organized atheism in the form of liberalism, evolutionary philosophy, and the anti-Genesis movement is capturing the minds of people everywhere. So for nearly two centuries, the promotion of democracy and freedom of conscience has made no provision for healing the deadly wound. The beast has been wounded. It is no longer active. Therefore, the beast since 1798 has been in the is not status, and the deadly wound will not be healed without the restoration of the power to persecute. The seven heads and the seven kings represent the same thing as the scarlet beast and the many waters. Mountains are sometimes used to symbolize governments or kingdoms. The 30th Psalm verse 7 Jeremiah chapter 51 verses 24 and 25, Daniel chapter 2 verse 35, 44 and 45. Several Bible versions make it clear that the seven heads, the seven mountains, and the seven kings are all identical. Revised Standard, New American Standard Bible, the New American Bible, etc. Chapter 17 verses 7 through 11. The beast has seven heads and ten horns. The seven heads are said to be seven mountains on which the women sitteth. Verse 9. And seven kings. Verse 10. 
These heads are the same as the ones on the dragon of Revelation 12 and the beast of Revelation 13. They represent the great world empires which Satan uses to persecute God's people. Five of these powers which have been noted in the books of Daniel and Revelation are fallen. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Pagan Rome, and Papal Rome. One is, this represents atheism which arose as a power after 1798 as manifested in the French Revolution and Communist Russia and was still in power at the time the investigative judgment began in 1844. One is not yet come. After the fall of the Soviet Union, the United States was the world's dominant superpower. And the beast that was, and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seventh, and goeth into perdition. Protestant America will lead the governments of the world to unite in support of Papal Rome. At the end of time, the power of Papal Rome is greater than ever. Her deadly wound is healed, and she again strongly persecutes God's people as in former years. The revived Roman Catholic Church unites with apostate Protestants and Spiritists to form a religious political entity that is supported by the governments of the world. But the power of the papacy will be eternally destroyed at the second coming of Jesus Christ. The historic center of Rome was built on seven hills and has been known since ancient times as the city of seven hills. The phrase seven mountains on which the women sitteth also serves to link the women with the city of Rome establishing her once again as the Roman Catholic Church. This chapter has to do with the end time. It is from this point which the angel gives his interpretation. So at the beginning of the end time in 1798, five are fallen. The head which is reigning, Godspeed, is head number six. The writer of the triumph of God's love calls this new approach which the devil is effectively using a new manifestation of satanic power. The triumph of God's love, page 159. A day of great intellectual darkness has been shown to be favorable to the success of the papacy. It will yet be demonstrated that a day of great intellectual light is equally favorable for its success. In past ages, when men were without God's word and without the knowledge of the truth, their eyes were blindfolded and thousands were ensnared, not seeing the net spread for their feet. In this generation, there are many whose eyes become dazzled by the glare of human speculations, science falsely so-called. They discern not the net and walk into it as readily as if blindfolded. God designed that man's intellectual powers should be held as a gift from his maker and should be employed in the service of truth and righteousness. But when pride and ambition are cherished and men exalt their own theories above the word of God, then intelligence can accomplish greater harm than ignorance. Thus the false science of the present day, which undermines faith in the Bible, will prove as successful in preparing the way for the acceptance of the papacy with its pleasing forms as did the withholding of knowledge and opening the way for its aggrandizement in the dark ages. The Triumph of God's Love, page 337. We are living in the time of the seventh head. Protestant America or apostate Protestantism is head number seven. Evidently there will be a revival of the beast which was and is not. For John was told the time would come when he would ascend out of the bottomless pit. Revelation chapter 17 verse 8. This would be a union of church and state. And if it had persecuting power, the power which revives the papacy could well be the seventh head. In order to understand fully how this could transpire, take another look at the lamb-like beast with two horns mentioned in Revelation chapter 13 verses 11 through 18. America was that lamb-like power. For more than 200 years, the lamb-like characteristics have continued. However, when the time comes that America speaks as a dragon, she will be instrumental in causing the whole world to worship the first beast. In causing the first beast to live, America will bring back the beast of intolerance or persecution. So the dragon phase of the two-horned beast would then become the seventh head. She would then be in opposition to God and his people and would lead out in causing the whole world to follow in her footsteps. In this setting, the revived papacy, Revelation chapter 13 verses 14 and 15, is called the eighth. Revelation chapter 17 verse 11. But the prophet recognized the eighth as one of the seven. He was destined for perdition, annihilation, complete destruction. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is lord of lords, and king of kings, and they that are with him are called, and chosen, and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, 
and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Verses 12 to 18. The fulfillment of these verses is yet future. It is clear that the ten kings have not yet received a kingdom. When they do receive power as kings one hour with the beast, Revelation chapter 17 verse 12, they will willingly collaborate with the beast inasmuch as they are said to have one mind. Revelation chapter 17 verse 13. This is a picture showing that the ultimate goal of ecumenicalism will finally become a reality for one hour or a comparatively short period of time. It is quite evident that the world of today, which is often referred to as Christian, will be the center of many of the last day decisions and actions. Before the end of earthly time, laws will be enacted that will, in effect, attempt to control the conscience of man. However, this will be done under the guise of achieving peace. In doing this, lawmakers will be following in the footsteps of the great power of the Dark Ages. Babylon forces all nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This will be a last great attempt to bring about a confederacy. The closing hours of time when the whole world unites against God's people are pictured in these last verses of this chapter. The prophet Isaiah also foretold this same worldwide uniting of the nations in the last days of earth. Read Isaiah chapter 8 verses 9 through 15. The term confederacy used by Isaiah is similar to the ten kings having one mind mentioned by the prophet John. These passages are parallel to those in Revelation chapter 16 verses 13 and 14 where the three unclean spirits are represented as gathering all nations to earth's final battle of Armageddon. The ten horns are the nations of Europe and all the nations of earth that they rally under the banner of Rome. Daniel chapter 7 verses 7 and 24. Revelation chapter 16 verse 14. They are also called the waters where the horse sitteth. Verse 15. And they that dwell on the earth, whose names were not written in the book of life. See Revelation chapter 13 verse 8. These nations give the end time church state alliance which is Babylon the Great, all of their strength to make war against Jesus, the Lamb, and his people who keep God's commandments and have the faith of Jesus. The nations of the world will support Babylon's Sunday law and disregard God's holy seventh-day Sabbath of creation and the Ten Commandments. They will enforce her decree, and those who disobey will not be allowed to buy or sell. Ultimately, they support legislation calling for the death of God's people. Revelation chapter 12 verse 17 Chapter 13, verses 11 through 18. Chapter 14, verse 12. However, when Jesus delivers his faithful followers, Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 20, the multitudes who have supported the great whore finally realize that they have been deceived and that they are eternally lost. Enraged, they will turn upon their religious leaders. Verse 16. Thus, by God's will, the punishment of the harlot of Babylon is carried out in part by her own allies. Here is another clear clue as to what power this is. There is only one city that claims to reign over the kings of the earth, and that is the Roman Vatican. Also, a woman in prophecy is a church or religious power. No other church claims the right to reign over the kings of the earth. And Rome was the city that ruled over the kingdoms of the world in the days of the Apostle John. Look especially at verses 14, 16, 17. God predicts victory. He can do this because he is Lord of lords and king of kings. Furthermore, even those who have united with the beast will reverse their stand and will help to overthrow this great false system. As the confederated nations strip Babylon of her power and participate in her destruction, they are executing the will of God. Once again, the wrath of man will be made to praise God. The 76th Psalm, verse 10. In summary, literal Babylon was the great city of ancient times. From the days of Babel, the city of Babylon has been representative of organized opposition to the purposes of God on earth. Genesis chapter 11 verses 4 through 6, Revelation chapter 14 verse 8. A city is a highly organized and integrated association of human beings. Hence how appropriate is Babylon the Great as a prophetic symbol for the organized, universal, apostate religious organization. Although in one sense, mystery Babylon may be considered as representative of apostate religious systems throughout history, Babylon the Great in the book of Revelation also designates the united apostate religions at the close of time. See Revelation chapter 14 verse 8, chapter 16 verses 13 through 14, chapter 18 verse 24. In Revelation chapter 17 verse 18, mystical Babylon is called the great city. Confer Revelation chapter 16 verse 19, chapter 18 verse 18. Babylon is referred to as great in view of the fact that this chapter deals most particularly with Satan's great final effort to secure the allegiance of the human race through religion. Babylon the Great is the name by which inspiration refers to the great threefold religious union of the papacy, apostate Protestantism, and Spiritism. See Revelation chapter 16 verse 13, 18, and 19. 
Confer Revelation chapter 14 verse 8, chapter 18 verse 2, Daniel chapter 4 verse 30, Zechariah chapter 10 verses 2 and 3, chapter 11 verses 3 through 9. What is the significance of the message of this chapter for those who in the last days are said to be with Christ? Revelation chapter 17 verse 14 and referred to as called and chosen and faithful. At a time when the whole world is represented as united against God and his people and forming a confederacy, Isaiah chapter 8 verses 9 through 15, enacting laws controlling the conscience, God's people are to remember that the Lamb shall overcome them. Our victory is dependent upon the almighty power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Upon him we can rely with perfect safety. In that fearful time, the righteous must live in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor. The restraint which has been upon the wicked is removed, and Satan has entire control of the finally impenitent. God's long suffering has ended. The world has rejected his mercy, despised his love, and trampled upon his law. The wicked have passed the boundary of their probation. The Spirit of God, persistently resisted, has been at last withdrawn. Unsheltered by divine grace, they have no protection from the wicked one. Satan will then plunge the inhabitants of the earth into one great final trouble. As the angels of God cease to hold in check the fierce winds of human passion, all the elements of strife will be let loose. There are forces now ready, and only waiting the divine permission to spread desolation everywhere. The Triumph of God's Love, pages 361-362 God has made provision whereby we can be protected from the deceptions which lie ahead. Remember God. Remember His power. Allow Christ to occupy the throne of your life. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57.